Hello, I'm so pleased to have you all here with us today. We really hope that this will be the first of many more continued conversations about issues of violence in the LGBT communities here in Chicago. But before we get started, I'd like to do two things. First of all, give our uh, heartfelt uh, felt thanks to uh, um, Beth Ritchie, who's the director of IRPP, for um, making these funds available for us to do this important work. And also to acknowledge the, our pretty extensive community teams that we've worked with throughout this year-long project. Uh, Mona Noriega, who's the commissioner for uh, human relations at the city of Chicago. She's with us here. We have Miriam uh, Zeidman, who's uh, with the Anti-Defamation League. We're anticipating uh, colleagues from the City of Chicago Police Department and the Center on Halstead as well. This project um, came out of a series of conversations about events that have been happening across the country uh, around violence against LGBT communities, but in particular uh, issues against uh, violence against trans individuals and in particular trans individuals of color. Across the national landscape and, as e and as in places of Europe and as well, there's been a lot of new attention around violence specifically among trans and uh, against uh, trans individuals. The reason is that there is a higher level of prevalence in other places across the country, but that this violence is um, exceeds what we see and with some of the other types of hate uh, violence against other marginalized groups, and that it often culminates in the murder of that individual. Okay. So in Chicago, over the last couple of years, there have been two pretty well-publicized cases of trans deaths here in, in Chicago, murder against trans individuals. Both of them have been young people, young trans women of color, um, primarily on uh, living on the west and south sides of Chicago. Uh, Mona Noriega, uh, in her role, is very interested in um, reaching out to uh, communities that are experiencing targeted victimization due to a status, their individual status, whether it be race, ethnicity, immigration status, religion, or, or sexual orientation, gender identity. And she convened the group to be able to better understand what is happening here in the landscape of Chicago, what is known, what is unknown, and she wasn't immediately able to put her finger on any specific information. So she brought a number of our uh, key stakeholders to the table, and it was, it's been a marvelous, marvelous series of meetings and collaborations over the last year. We've met five times as a large group, in addition to the countless hours that the, that the researchers have uh, spent gathering the data. Um, so this is, I think, an example of what IRPP has intention when they talk about community-engaged research, community-driven um, uh, and, and participatory research um, in, in, its, in its sort of highest form. But also, the number of the questions that were initially asked and on the table have really strong policy impl implications. And we'll talk about that as it go goes along, policy in terms of the actions that are taken by this, on the steps of uh, on behalf of the city, uh, policy around behaviors of the police uh, and their data gathering, and, and uh, things, other things that can be done uh, on a citywide level. So with that, let me turn you over to Megan Conrad who, and Kyle, who will both be presenting <coughs> the actual findings uh, from the project. Yep. All right. Again, thank you all for coming. Uh, project, as uh, Dr. Matthews said, uh, Effects of Race, Gender, and Sexual Orientation on the Experience of Hate Crimes in Chicago. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Getting into the background of this project, hate crimes, um, as I'm sure you've all heard, are crimes that are motivated by racial, sexual, or other prejudice. Um, 73% 73 of hate crimes involve violence compared with 23% of all other hate, um, all other crimes. So that statistic right there really points to why it's really important uh, to examine hate crimes further. Uh, racial bias is the most frequently reported hate crime motivation. Um, and there are a number of reasons uh, behind that. So when race is relevant, almost immediate and uniform characterization, uh, the crime is almost uniformly characterized as a hate crime. Um, it's become part of our you know, zeitgeist to find, 
to find it unacceptable for uh, discrimination against someone for their race. So uh, examples here, Ricky Birdsong and James Burr Jr., they were murdered by the KKK uh, back in 98 and 99. Um, immediately, the media portrayed this as a uh, hate crime, uh, specifically for their race. Um, however, crimes against LGBT individuals do not always get classified as hate crimes. Um, there's massive underreporting of hate crimes against LGBT individuals to law enforcement, to law enforcement agencies, but not necessarily to community-based organizations. Um, and part of that has to do with historically LGBT populations have wanted to, you know, have wanted to remain. Uh, get services from people to understand. They don't want to get services from people, but they, you know, we don't want to uh, have to explain things or experience possible discrimination. Uh, this is, of course, changing with projects like this. Uh, people are starting to come forward a little more to law enforcement, but it's still largely reported more to community-based organizations. Now, hate crimes against transgender individuals are typically grouped in with those against LGBT uh, people. I always want to say LGBT people. I have to stop myself there. Um, so crimes against trans individuals are different for several reasons. Um, there is an increased uh, severity of violence, increased sexual assault against trans individuals when compared to LGB individuals. Um, so basically, they're much more likely to get murdered, uh, much more likely to experience severe injury uh, when compared to LGB individuals. Um, there's also some uh, judicial and ser services, uh, judicial and services system. Um, it's gender binary, so it's really hard for trans individuals to uh, receive services. Uh, you know, you see a lot of the uh, shelters that are out there; they're for women or the few services that are out there for men, uh, it's hard for trans, individu trans individuals to go and receive those services. Um, and also, crimes, against, crimes uh, committed against biological males are not generally considered a hate crime. Uh, so there are a number of barriers that trans individuals face to uh, getting due process uh, and also uh, receiving services. So trans women have been the target of escalating rates of violence, and uh, being an ethnic minority confers additional <coughs> vulnerability, vulnerability to violence. So trans women of color are particularly uh, at risk for experiencing uh, murder, uh, being victims of murder, uh, being raped. Um, so it's really important that we look at this. Uh, almost, there's almost a uh, complete motivational silence when the victim is, tran is a transgender person of color. Uh, again, it's since trans individuals are not necessarily accepted, and then there's also the racial component there. There, you know, the media doesn't necessarily always report uh, on it when there is some kind of uh, violence against these individuals. Um, and also, there's a question of how much the victim's gender presentation or their race inspired the, the violence. Our aims of this research were to develop a more complete picture of hate crimes against the LGBT community in Chicago, uh, illustrate the specific violence that transgender individuals face, and also report to the Chicago Commission on Human Relations to help shape policy decisions as they uh, affect LGBT people and LGBT people of color. So it was a retrospective cross-sectional and descriptive design. Uh, we were able to get data from the Center on Halstead, oh, Center of Halstead, Center on Halstead, and the Chicago <coughs> Police Department. Um, they've been very helpful, very gracious partners. Um, very glad to work with them. Um, and as Dr. Matthews was saying, we also uh, got to work closely with the Chicago Commission on Human Relations. And part of what we're going to talk about is you know, how that relationship came, how these relationships came about, and how we can uh, further, further these relationships uh, to shape policy in this area. So the anti-violence project at the Center on Halstead, it pr provides uh, crisis support and ongoing services to the LGBTQ uh, population and HIV-affected survivors of abuse and violence. So this is a national project. Um, 
It is part of the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs, uh, the Center on Halstead. They have specific counseling and incidents reporting services, uh, court accompaniment services. Uh, so try to make people feel as comfortable as possible coming to seek help and services at this community-based organization. Um, and for, for those of you that don't know what the Center on Halstead is, it's a, uh, thank you. It is a, uh, LGBT specific organization, uh, been around since what, the 70s or so? Can you? Yeah. More? Okay. Yeah, yeah. It hasn't always been as big as it is, but it's been around for a little while, yeah. Um, now, the Chicago Police Department, uh, they collect and aggregate information on all reported crimes. Uh, they become increasingly interested in collecting sexual identity information from both perpetrators of crimes and victims of crimes. So these are two organizations that are collecting information, uh, but for very different purposes. And this has definitely affected the type of information that they are gathering. Um, so the Center on Halstead is, of course, community uh, resources or oriented, and the police department, they are more concerned with um, trying to you know, protect people and persecute crimes. So, now the Chicago Commission on Human Relations um, enforces the Chicago Human Rights and Chicago Fair Housing Ordinances, uh, investigates claims of discrimination, and one of the really interesting things they do is go out into the actual communities uh, to help mediate. Um, bring mediation programs to decrease violence um, and bigotry and partnership with the communities. So just going over some of the uh, descriptive results from the Center on Halstead. Um, as you can see here, uh, the crimes that were reported, um, most of them, this was actually, I think a surprise to all of us, uh, domestic violence was actually the crime that was reported most. Uh, it's followed by bias, so bias, prejudice, and then um, the, crime, the crimes weren't always classified. And uh, as you can see here, most, uh, for community area, 19 of them were unknown, but uh, as you can see, Uptown, Rogers Park, and Lakeview uh, were following um, as far as the community areas where the violence were happening. And this makes sense in that their LGBT individuals have more of a visible presence in these neighborhoods. Now, the caller identity, um, again, most of the time was un, oh no, most of the time was victim, and then next, uh, next largest category was unknown. But there was also a large service provider component, so people that were, uh, people, uh, like social workers, things like that, uh, calling and reporting violence. The types of crimes, uh, as we can see, domestic violence was the largest one, but then there was also assault with no weapon, uh, intimidation, and sexual assault, and verbal harassment uh, were uh, significant categories. And then the bias motive, again, domestic violence. Um, but heterosexist anti-LGBT was the next largest category, um, and there was also no apparent bias. So this, so that those wouldn't necessarily be classified as hate crimes. No apparent bias. We um, wouldn't know what was going on. Um, but getting more into the specific domestic violence crimes and offenses, um, you can see it was most uh, the largest category was psychological and emotional abuse, followed by physical abuse, and then there's also. Uh, isolation and economic abuse. So people that are economically dependent on their partner and being abused in that way or uh, in some other familial situation. Uh, so as far as uh, whether the report, whether the uh, incidents were reported to the police, um, in the incidences where the complaint was taken, there was no, no arrest was the largest category. Um, then also offender arrested, and, also, and, and you can see a small number of the victims or clients were also arrested. Um, as you can see, most of the time we don't actually know whether the uh, victims uh, reported the incident to the police. Um, but then there are also a significant amount, 15% of the victims did not actually report anything to the police. Um, so as far as the bias classification, Again, uh, most of them are actually unknown, 80%. So, all right, so uh, getting to the summary, uh, 
heterosexist, anti-LGBT violence was the most common motive for hate crimes. Um, again, assault, verbal harassment, intimidation, and sexual assault were the most common types of crimes. Domestic violence was overall the most prevalent type of crime. Uh, the caller was usually the victim or a service provider when known, and most often, not, most often uh, these incidences were not reported to the police or reported with no arrest. So if we can shift focus here, so, so obviously coming from a community um, organization, we've got a, uh, perhaps a different um, group of people who are reporting there versus who's reporting to the police themselves. Um, and the community organization is, the focus is to sort of um, aggregate all of these these cases and aggregate this data um, and then really provide a lot of supportive services um, to facilitate reporting to the police if that's something that um, the caller is interested in. So we um, have several tables here then that reflect the data from the Chicago Police Department. Um, so again, this is more general. It's not only looking at LGBT individuals, it's looking at uh, hate crimes reported overall. So we'll just give you a second to take that in. And then here again, looking at um, who is most likely to experience a crime that has been designated a hate crime. Um, the racial category is, is usually African American, black, um, and then the victim is generally male, as far as we know. And then you can see here sort of a comprehensive table of all the different types of crimes and offenses that are reported and designated some sort of hate crime or have some sort of bias attached. And so the summary here is that the crimes most often mo are most often motivated by racial or sexual orientation bias. So when bias is assigned, that's generally those are the, the two categories that are most common. Um, and then simple assault or criminal defacement were most common. So again, some sort of violence component in the first. In the second, um, some sort of um, you know physical or vandalism component to that. Um, victims are most often on the young side, so age 19 to 30. Um, if you aggregate those two blocks, those were, most people were in those couple of categories. Uh, the racial identity of the victims, most often black or Caucasian, and uh, biological sex, I would assume, is most often male. Um, and then the case status is undetermined just in terms of what we were, um, you know, able to find out. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, when you say mostly the gender is male, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we're, there's a bit of a time lag. Excuse me? Oh, sure. So the, the question is whether um, the, the sex, because we're saying most often it's male, is it because that's, those are the sort of categories available to the police? So we're running on a bit of a time lag here. Um, when we came into this project, talking to the police, it's sort of an interesting and transitional time when some of these things are changing. So at the time this data was collected, it seems like um, you know either the, the biological sex was not uh, gathered, was not collected, or yes, the options are going to be female or male. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Exactly. Right, so it's a bit of an overlap, right? Mm -hmm. So we think, so again, um, because domestic violence is the most uh, common overall crime, the question is if two people are sharing a household, that's generally when you see domestic violence and they're same-sex partners, how, how is it possible to sort of um, put together those two ideas? And so in this case, that's an interesting question sort of overall is if you're usually thinking of a hate crime or some sort of bias as relating to the victim's identity, so either racial identity or sexual orientation identity or gender identity, uh, that's what's getting it designated as a hate crime. So when we talk about domestic violence, that's a bit more difficult to figure out because if you are in a same-sex household, it's sort of, is there really a bias there? It's difficult to say. Exactly, exactly. So that's a little bit, it's what's so interesting when you look at these data is, you know, where are the overlaps here? And what are we really talking about at this point? Is there another question? Yeah? You know, I, I just think it's something that's important to clarify is that when we're talking about hate crimes, it's a little bit of a misnomer because hate isn't actually an element. Right. It involves targeting a person because that's right. of those protected characteristics. Right. And so it is entirely possible that you could have um, some targets from somebody within the same um, protected characteristics. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. 
So, um, so we were just talking about sort of the legal designation of hate crime. So hate crime is sort of a shortcut term, sort of a short, you know, something to, that you can say easily and kind of remember. Um, but what it really refers to is the fact that the victim is victimized because of something about their identity. So again, racial identity, sexual orientation, gender identity, something about their identity is motivating the crime in some way. So it is possible to have some sort of domestic violence situation where that is a part of the motive. But again, it's, I understand that it's a more difficult thing to wrap your head around. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's revisit our aims. Let's kind of bring it all back together. So our first aim was really to develop a more complete picture of hate crimes against the LGBT community in Chicago. As we saw through those multitude of tables, there's a lot of information available. Um, so again, from the Center on Halstead, we're seeing a lot of assault, verbal harassment, intimidation, and sexual assault. Those are the most commonly reported crimes that come with some sort of bias. Um, and then domestic violence, again, is the highest crime reported overall. Um, and then from the Chicago Police Department, we get sort of the same picture. So again, an assault piece, as well as some sort of defacement, some sort of vandalism, um, damage to property, perhaps. Um, and then again, a little more information about what these victims are looking like. So again, sort of on the young side, African American or Caucasian are most common, um, biosex of male, and then um, the percentage attributed to sexual orientation within that group is a little bit higher than the national average as reported by the FBI, but again, that those reports come with some sort of time lag, so it's difficult to really compare them. Uh, they didn't both happen yesterday, so it's difficult to take those um, and, and compare them directly, but from what we have, that's what it that's what the comparison looks like. Our second aim was to illustrate the specific violence that transgendered individuals face. If you notice, we did not have anything about transgendered people in any of those tables. So Center on Halstead is very careful to not identify the people who call in, um, which is a big buy-in from the community to make sure that it's anonymous, it's safe to report to the Center on Halstead. So there are those kinds of demographics are not collected. Um, with the Chicago Police Department, again, because if we're looking at biological sex as sort of this binary category, um, there is no sort of second gender identity question. So that makes it a little difficult to, to figure out who is reporting and, and is there a difference between their biological sex and their, their current gender identity. So unfortunately, we weren't able at this, at the time we made all these tables, to uh, conclude anything sort of uh, firm about violence specific to transgendered individuals, but the story doesn't stop there. So um, when we came time to report this to the Commission on the Chicago Commission on Human Relations, it wasn't sort of one meeting, it's been several meetings coming through the past uh, year or so, and um, it was almost an immediate reaction from all of these interested organizations. So it was wonderful to kind of have everybody come together. This seemed to be something that a lot of different organizations were interested in. So you can see right there just part of the list. Um, and these are, you know, ongoing as well. So what was really crucial for us and what everyone was so great about was developing these working relationships and giving us access to all these numbers. So um, what we found is really making, making it clear what our goals were, what we wanted to do with this data, why it was so important to look at these things, and then making sure that everybody was sort of on the same page in terms of the story we wanted to tell. And really developing a, a more collaborative atmosphere. It wasn't us taking the data and going away to some room somewhere. It was everybody working together to really make a better picture of what's going on here so we can see where the needs are and where we need to go uh, to next. So again, as I said, Center on Halstead is very careful about de-identifying its data, so that was a relatively um, quick access point for us data-wise. And because it's part of a national data collection effort, the categories are very standardized. It's sort of you know, easy to sort all those things. Um, and what was interesting is when you're talking about bias, it's really from the perspective in this particular set from the caller. And you saw that a lot of times it was the victim, sometimes it was unknown what the relationship was, a lot of times it was the service provider. So again, sort of trying to make sense out of all of those pieces. From the um, Chicago Police Department, we were getting data from case reports, so it, was, it took a little bit longer, because we had to be just as careful to identify all of those records. And so it took a little bit longer to put all that together, because we wanted to be as careful as possible in making sure that we were uh, presenting everything in, a, in the correct light and the way it actually is, and, and being careful to, to maintain an anonymity that way. Um, and then again, looking at how the police classify hate crime. So again, taking it from when these incidents are reported, you know, it's a different mechanism there. 
Okay, so if we talk about implications for policy, um, we're really talking about, I think that the, the most uh, obvious thing is to start considering this transgendered status when we're taking criminal reports, um, certainly from the police perspective. At the time we were meeting with them, they were actually already implementing some of those things already. And so we, again, this time lag gets you where, you know, things have started rolling out, and so it'll, it'll, it'll take a little while for us to catch up with the numbers. Um, and so that was, that's sort of the most important piece in terms of being able to describe what's going on. Um, and then the second piece is really talking to the community at large about why this is still really important. What is a hate crime? Why is it important to report these things? What does this do for the community, for us as people who want to understand what's going on and what services are needed? Um, and then again, making sure we publicize our experience, which I think we're doing right now with all these cameras and microphones around. <laughs> better than perhaps we planned. Um, <laughs> and again, this domestic violence piece is very interesting. So this idea that um, domestic violence, unfortunately, you know, does not just reside in opposite sex couples, right? That's how you usually think of it. Um, within the LGBT community, it's an increasing concern as well. And making sure that those individuals are getting the services they need. So as Kyle was saying before, these barriers that trans people, most more specifically perhaps trans women face, getting the same services that, you know, biologically female <coughs> people are able to get. Um, and how they are sort of treated and provided services. Um, so again, community outreach, awareness, um, and then yes, again, so, um, you know, making sure that we offer services for trans women as well. Okay, and so just to wrap up, um, again, this was not just one organization doing this, it was several, so I want to thank all of these people in my name and countless other people as well. Um, and I think that does it, so thank you. So, oh, yes. Yeah, yes. So, uh, um, I, I, I teach a class in violence prevention across the lifespan, and what I really try and emphasize in this class is kind of you know, creating um, you know, cohesive, coordinated, comprehensive um, community-based plans to prevent violence. And so certainly there's room for everyone at the table, and I think this presentation kind of, you know, no matter what hat we're wearing in this room, there's a place for us um, at the table to prevent you know, violence against LGBTQ individuals. Um, so we talk about, you know, intervening at the individual level, you know, increasing individuals' knowledge and skills. Um, you know, we talk about uh, um, intervening at the relationship level. So certainly uh, domestic violence in LGBT uh, couples is certainly an understudied, underknown area. And perhaps we need specific uh, information education on, on uh, you know, how we educate the LGBT community about negotiating, you know, conflicts in relationships. Um, there's certainly plenty of uh, room for uh, changes at the community level, whether it's community organizations, you know, in increasing their services, uh, the, the domestic violence uh, community, the sexual assault community, the LGBT community uh, as an organization, the Chicago police. Um, there's room for changes in all these organizations and how they address um, LGBT folks. And certainly laws and legislation, you know, kind of clarifying um, hate crimes. Um, you know, uh, the marriage equity, uh, you know, debate that's going on, you know, right now in Illinois. Um, all these things will kind of shape, uh, you know, social norms and social perceptions. Hopefully, you know, increase tolerance, increase um, acceptance of people from, you know, a variety of backgrounds. Um, so that's one of the emphasis in my class. The other one is we talk about primary, secondary, and, and tertiary prevention um, or, or intervention. So certainly on the, on the tertiary side, so after violence has occurred, um, you know, there's certainly, you know, lots of room uh, for improvements. Um, I was very encouraged, so on the one slide when they talked about, you know, for those at, from the Center on, Center on Halstead data, when victims did interact with police or report to police, you know, the majority of them reported those, uh, those uh, interactions as courteous. Um, I was actually surprised, you know, when I get pulled over for speeding, I don't know if I'd give them a 50% rating, but I tend to get a little smart with police when they pull me over. So it's probably an interaction going on there. But, but you know, by and large, the police are, are responding in, in a courteous way. So that gives us some information to, to give back to the LGBT community is that, you know, you don't have to be um, as afraid of reporting to the police as maybe, you know, um, you had more reason to be years ago. Um, 
certainly some of those I interactions with police weren't positive. So there's certainly room on, on the police side to improve education and procedural justice. Um, so, you know, uh, and as we mentioned before, you know, domestic violence shelters, you know, women only shelters, we need to find um, alternatives for uh, uh, people of uh, varying um, uh, gender identities to receive important life saving services. So, after the fact, we need to, to, there's plenty of places to intervene in a secondary prevention kind of way. So, secondary prevention is all about kind of, you know, increasing uh, uh, the early identification, um, increasing reporting so that people can get the services um, and the justice that they deserve. Um, and so, clearly, some of the uh, between uh, uh, training with police, training the community, um, you know, increase in awareness, hopefully will, will uh, you know, increase the number of victims of crimes that are willing to report those crimes, um, you know, so that, uh, you know, perpetrators can be brought to justice and that victims can get the services they need. Um, and then, of course, uh, primary prevention um, is what I'm uh, most interested in. Um, obviously, uh, hate crimes, domestic violence, um, all these crimes of interpersonal violence uh, are, are tragedies um, and uh, they're heartbreaking stories. And the only real way, in my opinion, to deal with them is, is to pre prevent that violence um, in the first place. So, uh, you know, we need to, uh, you know, educate our young children. We need to educate our service <coughs> providers, um, our communities. Um, and really, like I said, there's just room for everybody at the table um, to work on this issue. And I'm so glad that you're all uh, here today and uh, looking forward to you all being part of the conversation um, as this group is going to continue to meet um, over, over the next few years to uh, address these issues and many more from, the, the, from uh, our initial findings here. So thank you very much. So now we have time for Q&A. Anyone who's in the corner who wants to ask a question, just wave your hand and I'll come on over with the mic. This is a, both a, a question, it's a comment then a question. First, just deep appreciation for your work. Um, it, it really is exactly what we hope IRPP would be uh, in, the sense that um, you know, there's at least three departments from our campus involved, psychology, criminology, college of nursing, which often feels sort of far away from here. And then your ability to collaborate with community partners, it's, and it seems like a serious collaboration, not a studying collaboration. I'd like to hear some from the community partners if that's true, but it certainly seems that way. And partners who don't necessarily collaborate um, always so well with each other. When I think about Center on Halstead and, and the Chicago Police Department, I think, hmm, those are further away than nursing and <laughs> criminology in some ways. Um, so, so, I, so praise for that. And then I guess a question about how it, is it the topic that made it possible to do this, the urgency, the passion that groups feel about the topic? Or is there something else that made it possible for you to work across disciplines, across the divide between a university and community, across orientation of agencies in a community to do this kind of work? Can you send that to our community partners? Yeah, I'd be interested to hear from them if you'd be willing. Um, okay, so, well, uh, you know, I think I heard uh, over the weekend <clears throat> at a conference that uh, work proceeds at the rate of trust. And so it was really important that uh, we get together the stakeholders. And being a community activist, I know who the stakeholders are. Um, and I can figure out who our partners might be who are invested in this project. And, who, and so what you want to do is build the baseline for what, what our common interests are. And so we began from there. You know, Center on Halsted is interested in hate crimes. You know, the police department is interested in addressing hate crimes. The Commission on Human Relations is an anti-defamation league, has a long history that we could learn from. So those were all the appropriate partners that uh, if we could build our baseline of what it is that we have in common, the difficulty is acknowledging where we're different. We all have different interests. 
But if we could focus on what we have in common and we build our trust in how we can communi communicate across that difference, then we can come out with a product. Because for my position, I can't do anything about hate crimes if I don't understand it. And I don't have the numbers. You know, we don't have the numbers that are really indicative of what we think the truth is. When I look across the country and I see higher levels of, uh, um, when I see that transgender people are being killed, and when I see that it's occurring here in the city of Chicago, and yet we don't have, we don't have a real understanding of why or how, how can we intervene? And if my job is to do outreach and education and or supportive services, I need more information. And, and Lisa Gilmore for Center on Halstead is also <laughs> snuck in. <laughs> Thank you for this presentation. I have a, a question about the summary slide where um, you presented the fact that um, Center on Halstead does not collect caller information or demographics and um, the police department only collects or collected information about male and female. So so I, when, when you presented the slide, I turned to Mona and I said, so we don't know what's going on with violence against transgender people. Like, we, it, it was glaring and I am shocked uh, because I think it, it is such a big problem and it is talked about and yet I feel nobody's collecting this information and how do we do policy if we don't know the data? And um, so you mentioned something about um, changes that have occurred since you started. Um, I would also, so does that mean that the police is now um, collecting information that might say male, female, transgender, or other, um, if you have any information about that? And then um, what are your recommendations as a research team to the Center on Halstead and to the police department? Thank you. I think so too. Thank you, Miriam. So I'll let Lori answer in specific relation to what the police department is doing in terms of collecting information. And what I will add, um, and perhaps there are others in the room who are better qualified to speak on this topic, but um, the FBI collects data every year on hate crimes. And there are specific categories and uh, boxes that need to be checked when forms are being sent in by various police departments. Uh, educational institutions, cities, and all sorts of other entities. And um, categorically for 2013, those categories are going to be changing with respect to the gender area. And so there is going to be information that's going to be collected on transgender issues too. So there's going to be additional categories, not just male or female. There's going to be, when you're talking about sexual orientation, it's not just going to be sexual orientation. It's also going to be gender identity. There's going to be a box for gender nonconforming. Um, and, th and this is a Department of Justice initiative overall in um, following up on the, uh, the enactment of the Matthew Shepard James Byrd Jr. Hate Crime Prevention Act, which added those additional ca categories. Lori, if you want, I don't know if you want to add. Well, in addition to that, um, the Chicago Police Department does keep uh, very accurate statistics on hate crimes, but we're bound by uniform crime reporting, the UCR, what, which Miriam spoke about. And that, in my opinion, has needed to expand for a very long period of time. But I could tell you um, if it was a biological male or a biological female that was victimized or if it was a trans individual and if the bias was because of their status or uh, the way that they identify themselves. But that's not what we can report. We can only report what the Uniform Crime Reporting states. Um, I, I, I believe that this group that's coming together is going to help in so many ways. I'm glad that the Anti-Defamation League is, is present at the table because they're the ones who can go to legislators and they, you know, they, they write the briefs for DOMA and all of that kind of stuff. I'm glad that the commission is at the table because we share every bit of information with them in regards to hate crime so that they could be a victim advocate. Center on Halstead, it usually works the reverse. Somebody had stated um, 
very surprised it seems like two opposite ends of the table and at times it can seem that way but in reality I just spoke to Lisa yesterday she has my cell phone number I have her cell phone number we are in this together this is a team effort um, anyone who is victimized because of who they are that is so horrific she's not able to give me every bit of information which is frustrating because I'm a, the facts and only the facts ma'am I sometimes take my shoe off to talk to it like it's a bat phone but I, I want these crimes reported because it's like the broken window theory if we don't have the information we can't fix it but she's bound by what she is bound by in the confidentiality this is why I think that this group is so very important and I applaud this as well and Mona bringing it to the table Commissioner Noriega because unless the community is aware that we are an active partner and we want to resolve these issues they're, they're not going to um, we're not going to get anywhere. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be a part of this. And, and just like anything, you know, uh, you spoke about the, the police officer pulling you over. I've had bad experiences with police. I, 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 I spoke and I was very pleased to speak at the ADL um, a couple of, uh, two days ago. And I gave my own um, story, personal story, about how much bias and prejudice that I've had within the police department. Doctors have it, teachers have it, students have it. It's everywhere. But unless we speak up and talk about it, it's not going to be corrected. So I'm not here to say that the police department's perfect, but I'm willing to say that we're ready to be a partner, as always. Okay, hi, so my name is Lisa Gilmore. I'm from Center on Halstead. Um, and so I actually wanted to respond to your question that we do actually collect demographic data um, when we're able to uh, with the survivors that we work with, but we de-identified um, this data set before we sent it. Um, particularly in relation to this being a first time project, um, I'm a very conservative person with uh, de uh, data that could be considered identifying of victims. Um, so that is, that is there. Um, secondly, you know, like I can even, since this was the 2010 data, I even know like right off the top of my head, two trans women were murdered, one in May, one in July that year. You know what I mean? So like it's, it's some of it's here, but it's not all there. Um, <clears throat> and another thing to just remember in terms of uh, FBI and uniform uh, reporting, that um, not all law enforcement districts still participate in that. And the way that they might report the data to the FBI might depend on what's going on in their local area as well. So if they're not collecting information that says transgender along the way, it might not even get put into the report when they do go to report it. So I think the, the combination of having both um, information from community-based organizations as well as um, law enforcement is, is an important combination. Um, and then I guess what I would like to say about, to, to uh, Professor Ritchie, to your comment, um, is, um, you know, that for us, for Center on Halstead, what I thought was really, really important about participating in this is um, when I am able to call Sergeant Cooper or someone else because a survivor has given me permission to do that, I ask, can I contact someone and let them know this happened? Even if they don't want me to give their personal information, because we know that these things often exist in pattern. Right, so the more I can let folks know there's a pattern of something going on, even a particular, if a particular survivor or victim doesn't want that, their personal information shared, law enforcement can have their ears out and then all of a sudden Cooper's like, oh my God, I heard about six things like that within the past six weeks. That's something to pay attention to. Um, so that is a way that it's really, really important to have relationships between the different organizations. Um, and also it, um, you know, for me, hearing the number of times that I might ask a survivor do you want to contact law enforcement? Can we help you? Can we go with you? So maybe you'll feel more safe. Um, even when they don't, they don't still want to do that, no matter what amount of support might be available from a community-based organization, I think that's a problem. Um, and so I feel as a community-based organization, we also, being the people that have a lot of this information directly from community members, it's our responsibility to be sharing that with other folks about how um, the community's perception of safety um, is, is an impediment to the goals of some of these other organizations, right? So if the community doesn't feel safe reporting, Chicago Police or the Commission on Human Relations, they, they can't work towards their goals more effectively. Um, and for me personally, uh, the relationships with people around the table are really important, and I have a high, uh, high value on building the number of people that I feel safe linking survivors to. 
Um, so I might feel more safe when I have relationships with particular members of organizations than with others. And I'm, I'm interested in somebody like saying, just call. Just call 911. Just call the commission. It's going to be great. Um, but until that day when I feel like 100% I can do that, I'm going to continue to find it to be a high priority as a community-based organization to be building relationships um, to improve that. Part of it was informed by your response, and um, I think they said the data was from 2010. So I'm interested in knowing what's happened since then, and kind of what's on the horizon in terms of where where the research is going. Um, what you know, if you, as much as you all can share in terms of what, what's going on with the research now. So I think with some of the changes that are being implemented in terms of the way information is collected, I think that's going to be a huge part of it. Is just having that information coming in. Um, sort of locally here in Chicago as well as nationally having those sorts of categories being included so we do have a more complete picture of what's going on um, so I think that would be probably the biggest piece that will change you know moving forward that we'll be really interested in seeing um, can you, anything else? Oh, and, uh, you know it's funny as, as, uh, as uh, researchers here at, at, at UIC and involved in the social sciences, you know, you think we'd be on, on the cutting edge of things, but it's, <laughs> but you know, mm -hmm. we're, 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 we're talking about, you know, police having more than a male female box. And I look back at my own research and say, wow, how often have, I, mm -hmm. I just had a male female box and, and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, race and ethnicity, um, you know, is another area, you know, black, white, Hispanic, other. How many people are we forcing, you know, you know, not not recognizing their, you know, multiracial, you know, personal identity and boiling that down to other? Um, so I think, you know, all research moving forward, um, you know, kind of needs to be, um, you know, more, more, uh, you know, gender and racial uh, uh, specific. Um, so yeah, so uh, uh, two projects I'm planning for the future. One is, uh, you know, looking at. Um, intimate partner violence in same-sex relationships, um, a vastly un understudied um, area. And then another thing we're looking at is uh, when relationships end. So we know in adult uh, abusive relationships, when relationships end, that's when a, a, a woman in particular is most uh, at risk for severe violence or death. Um, we don't have that same information for teen dating relationships. You know, are teens after a breakup more vulnerable uh, for victimization. We, we do know with teen relationships there's a lot of uh, uh, self-harm, suicidal ideation, suicide attempts following the end of, end of uh, relationships. So in, in that project too, we're going to you know, be more inclusive and, and even though same-sex relationships you know, might be a small part of that, uh, that data set, you know, ultimately um, it's important that we ask those questions and we start gathering that data so that we can, uh, our interventions, our prevention programs um, can be more, more targeted and more effective. Any other questions? I actually also have a response. Oh, okay. um, so I'm imagining a number of you uh, are, like myself, uh, data geeks in the room. Um, so if you are interested, I think some pieces um, relevant to the information that was presented today, recent changes, um, the CDC, uh, in January, released what we call the NISVIS, um, which is the first um, LGB only. So let's hear a room for some improvement on data collection, right? Um, LGB only specific information from the CDC on uh, national samples of intimate partner violence and sexual violence for LGB people. Um, and the, the percentages that they found are actually different than some of the ones we've been using for years within the field. So I have to update all of my presentations now. Um, but I think that's also fantastic because the fact that there's a federal body that just like launched a big piece of information about LGB people is cool. Um, and then also the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act that just occurred specifically enumerated LGBTQ, LGBT people um, as an underserved and at risk population. Um, and that so what we're hoping for within that is uh, an increased ability to reach out to mainstream, non-LGBT specific providers about how they um, need to be accountable to serving LGBTQ survivors. So a lot of the things talked about in terms of shelter access, you know, there's not one single bed for a male survivor of violence in the city of Chicago, right? 
a domestic violence bed. Regar not even about transgender identity, which we know there's more stigma around that. So there's huge rooms for improvement. Um, and I just got an email the other day, which I'm really proud of, that I, I just want to tout myself, um, from our national coalition that we provide our data to, um, a more thorough data set than what I provided in a more de-identified way to this, uh, to this group, um, is that they said Center on Halstead's data collection has improved um, over since last year, so we actually have a lot more detailed demographic information for the person level analysis of the kind of experiences that um, survivors are having. Uh, just a question in terms of the coalition that you've built. Uh, are there any domestic violence programs involved with the coalition or represented on the coalition at all? the domestic violence programs that provide shelters to women and children? Yeah, that was a really unexpected part of, of the story, right? That, you know, the higher rates of uh, domestic violence reported um, was really unexpected. That's not what we were going in specifically looking for, um, but the data are there, and, and it's really highlighting an area which we need to make uh, have response to. So um, it's, it's implied suggestion, right, that, that we add someone from who represents work with uh, DV population. So, so thank you, yeah. And you're just, I just want to make sure, your, your work is ongoing, right? The, I'm, I know I should know this, but the funding, your, your funding is almost done, right? But the work is ongoing and so you'll be looking for ways to continue on and maybe as per Vicki's suggestion, broaden the coalition to keep moving forward, especially given the changing landscape of what might even be possible with some of the reporting and legislative changes. Good. Is there an effort to move towards working with offenders as well? Um, particularly uh, LGBT offenders of domestic violence, uh, particularly. Um, and I'm maybe interested in knowing what that would even look like. There's a faculty member, uh, Carol Smith, in College of Nursing, whose research, funded research, is specifically looking at female perpetrators of violence in same-sex uh, relationships. And so um, that's been studied, funded by Lesbian Health Fund, and she, that's their, her area, she's done her dissertation work on and now is continuing that. So she'd be an ac excellent person to, um, for you to be in contact with and to inform our work here as well. Yeah. And there are um, two community-based organizations that are um, what are called PAPE, Partner Abuse Intervention Program Providers. Um, the Center for the Advancement of Domestic Peace, formerly Westside Domestic Abuse Project, um, does have a um, same-sex male uh, perpetrator group, which is, runs the same 26-week curriculum. It meets all the court-mandated requirements. Um, and then also um, Avanza Counseling, A-V-A-N-C-E, um, uh, takes referrals for folks for that partner abuse intervention programming um, of, of any gender. It's not always the case where, where uh, a perpetrator of a hate crime uh, goes all the way through the system and is prosecuted and then sentenced, although occasionally when it does happen, sometimes the judge, uh, if the, the commission is participating and observing that case all the way through, some of the remedies that are offered are peace circles. And so that the, um, the perpetrator sits down with the victim and or the people implicated, the victim's family perhaps, and the commission sometimes to represent the community that is being affected so that there is a peace circle um, as a part of, of the sentencing. One of the things I want to add at this point um, to this conversation is that not everyone in the community is in agreement with um, uh, pursuit of hate crime legislation. And the work here of the IRPP is towards prison abolition. Um, but I think what we've heard here is that we are primarily interested in prevention, right, and justice, 
as well as service provision. And we have a very blunt instrument at this point, right? Hate crimes legislation is a very, very blunt instrument. Um, it's kind of a two-parter. I'm wondering where, in terms of building this coalition, where victims are. Um, it seems like their voice is missing from this. Um, and the second question is, I was wondering if you could comment on uh, the motivational silence piece. Um, I think I used to work in the youth program at Center in Halstead, and so I know a lot of their stories. And a lot of them are you know, related to what we've been talking about. And maybe just talk about um, some strategies to lessen that kind of motivational silence. Well, we can try to answer that question, but uh, I mean, yeah, the, the, the voice of victims is, uh, you know, uh, eminently important. And, and essentially, we re relied on our, our partners, our personal experience, uh, you know, Lisa Gilmore brought, um, you know, was a huge advocate, of course, and, and voice for victims in a very protective, um, you know, important, important way. Um, um, yeah, as far as the, the, the motivational silence, um, I would have a tough time answering that. Yeah. Well, so this is when it becomes tricky, right? Because this is where this inter intersection happens. So we were specifically sort of highlighting, you know, case examples of transgendered women of color. And so it's, at some point it's a question, was it, was it race? Was it gender identity? Was it both? What's going on? And so that's sort of this other piece of trying to categorize all this stuff is, you know, we want to make sure that we're sort of represent, that the numbers really represent what's happening. Um, and oftentimes it's easiest to kind of understand a percentage. Um, but it's difficult because you have sort of multiple boxes you almost want to check. Um, and so I think that's where the, the sort of motivational silence comes in, is what's really sort of the most salient reason for this particular crime and what's really the biggest motive. Which. Exactly, right. So this interaction, you don't know what's driving it, sort of in that terms. <laughs> but it is, it is clear that out, but it is clear that outside of the gay press, the mainstream press will not label what is apparent to most other individuals that this um, particular murder was motivated by gender bias, right? Gender identity bias, transphobia, right? Um, and hopefully, as the, all the different work that's taking place continues is that, that there will be more of an increased awareness and naming of, of those individuals' experiences. You know, I think a, a part of this that's really important too is um, sometimes a part of our role at the center in doing what, what I'll call like victim advocacy or survivor support work is around um, negotiating how it is that we um, facilitate a space or a time when people can tell their stories in ways that they want to. Um, and, you know, a lot of times what, what, what we look for in relation to identifying, you know, and we use a broader thing at the center. We talk about hate violence because, you know, we're not going to rely on the legal definition of the law to talk about stuff that seems to be motivated by hate, right? Um, and, and so, Sometimes people, they don't, when we're, th when we're thinking of how do we, how do we analyze uh, to find the motivation behind what's going on, a lot of times we're really reliant on words, symbols, being in a certain location, all of these different types of things. And um, people don't always want to bring that back up when they're talking about their stories as well, right? Like a lot of times somebody on a, on a, on a maybe a call or a face-to-face -face interview will say, you know, they used like, so they used derogatory language or they called me bad names or all these different things. And it's like, at what time and place are we negotiating, asking what, what were those words? Do you want to talk about that right now? You know, and it's, it's a fine, you know, sometimes people are like, I just want them to stop it or not have it happen again. Um, just was talking with someone earlier today where it's like, no, I don't want to get that person involved, you know, in the criminal system because I know what happens to queer people in jail, right? Um, and so therefore I want to see if there's another solution to just keep them away from me. Like, and, and so there's all of this different stuff that happens. But I, you know, 
Um, part of it is like, in terms of survivor voice, um, any of us that were at the table who may also have ever had some kind of experience but didn't share that explicitly were a part of that. But um, I think that when we talk about the disproportionate representation that we know about, even though it wasn't included in my data set right now, about trans people of color and their experiences of victimization, um, as you know from being in the youth program, that might not necessarily be what they want right now, and that might not be their issue, their, uh, their understanding of justice, right, is what I think some of those options are. They're like, oh, no, I really need housing. <laughs> and what I need to happen when I'm in housing is not what just happened last week. So it's a, it's a totally different negotiation. I think moving forward, if we uh, started out from a spot of using new data, where we were asking people from the get-go, do you want to participate in this, right? As opposed to a highly de-identified uh, retro set of data. Um, that might be different for getting survivor voice involved, yeah. Maybe IRPP would fund that. That'd be so cool. Uh, and, and this is just relevant to um, thinking about what we can do to help advance what you're doing. Are there any champions of legislation uh, that we should be writing to? Or, and I don't know if I should ask the advocacy groups. Would that be helpful? Okay. Um, for me, I don't, uh, legislative advocacy around restructuring or naming new things in terms of hate crime definitions is not necessarily where I think things should roll to. Um, I'm more interested in legislative advocacy that might support an increase in prevention money, right? Um, you know, thinking about the variety of reasons as to why people might find themselves more at risk for being targeted. Um, we know if people are not housed, if people are in unsafe um, situations in terms of um, how they're surviving, how they're making money, um, the relationships that they're negotiating in order to remain safe or not safe or all these different things. Um, if we could have more prevention dollars about teaching healthy relationships when it comes to intimate partner violence, right? Um, but additionally, you know, I, I'm always like, who's going to start up the prevention program to prevent parents from kicking their kids out of the house because they're queer? Yay! Less people at risk for violence for being unhoused, right? Um, so that's huge arenas that I don't even know if people are really exploring that yet. I know that, you know, the National Institute for Justice just put out an RFP that is LGBT specific. Um, so that's heartening in a, in a way, right? Um, but we do need more data in order to also convince people that there need to be funds for programming to prevent the data from existing in the first place. I think that's a good place to end because that means you all have a charge that you have been given to go out and do some work around this topic. I want to thank you all for coming and especially thank our fabulous research team for sharing this work with us, for sharing your process with us. Um, as I said, if you would like to continue the conversation, please do. Please nosh on some snacks and come back next year for our next presentation. Thank you.